Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, as our children go to Children's Church, I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles back to the book of Ephesians. As you know, we are traveling through this marvelous epistle of Ephesians, and we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1 today, verses 3 through 14. We pick up where we left off last week. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. I'll give you just a moment to find your place in the scriptures. All right, so now before you get too comfortable, I'm going to invite you to stand as we honor God's word this morning. Starting in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having predestined according to the purpose of his will, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory, in whom you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Well, let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful time of worship that we've had, Lord Jesus, as we started out with the children singing praises to your great name. And then as we just ended with the choir special, Lord, we, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would meet with us, illumine our minds to the great truths of this passage. Father, we Pray that you would receive all the glory that is done and said in this place, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. When I was in seminary, I had a class. It was a Baptist history class, and our professor gave us an assignment, and in that assignment, we had to write 10 biographical sketches of 10 different Southern Baptists throughout the history of the Southern Baptist Convention. It had to be one page single spaced for each one. So that was a pretty big uh, project. Well, we, uh, we worked hard on the project. I, I, I worked hard and got my paper turned in and then uh, we were all anxious to uh, get our grades back and the professor came in to the class and he set down his, his books and everything, and he had a stack of the graded papers on his desk. He said, the good news is you're going to find out what you made on your project. He said, but the bad news is, is I have um, received word that a large number of you um, have plagiarized. He said, it has come to my attention that there is a website out there that has all kinds of biographical sketches. And many of you just simply cut, copied and pasted your papers. He said, now I've gone to the dean of the school. He said, personally, uh, I think that if you're studying to go in ministry, you should be above reproach. And because of this, I've asked the dean to have you excused from the seminary. He said, but the dean has more grace than I, and he told me not to excuse you from the seminary, but you will receive a failing grade for this paper, which was a rather large percentage of our grade. So as you can imagine, there was a little bit of anxiety in the room, and he passed out our papers, and I got my paper back. And I know you're all wondering <laughs> how I did. Now, should I be the good pastor or the bad pastor? Should I tell you? 
I'm grateful to tell you I did make an A on that paper. Uh, I, I did, uh, that certainly was one of my sources, uh, but I didn't plagiarize. You see, the problem was there were some who took credit for something that they should have not taken credit for. That's what plagiarism is. It's, it's saying that you did something when actually somebody else did something. And you know, really, this is the heart of thanksgiving, by the way. This is the spirit of thanksgiving. We are giving credit to the one who should receive the credit for all the blessings that we have. And that is what the Apostle Paul does in our text today. He gives credit to where credit is due regarding our salvation. Now, I want to go back to a couple things I said last week. Last week we read this entire text because uh, we, well, let me, let me just say this. We read the entire text, but we just focused on verse 3 last week. But it was necessary that we read the whole text because, if you remember, verses 3 through 14 in the original text are one long sentence. It's one long sentence. And what the Apostle Paul is doing, he is just thinking about God's grace in his life. And it's like he's traveling through this cave and he just, he's just seeing all the marvelous things that God has given us through Christ Jesus. And he's just naming them off as quickly as he can. It's almost like he's out of breath. And certainly, if this was one long sentence, he probably was out of breath at the end of this uh, sentence. It is a hymn of praise, literally. It was a hymn of praise that they would use in the, in the early church. Now just get in the mind of the Apostle Paul here for just a moment. Paul, a former persecutor and hater of the church. He was a murderer, a persecutor of Christians, but yet he is thinking, how in the world am I now at this place that I am at in my life now? It's not because of Paul. It's because of God Almighty. And so what Paul is doing is he's saying, I'm going to give credit to where credit is due. And so he wants God to receive all the credit. And I hope that as you sit here today, that that is the motivation of your life. That you want the credit to go to where credit is due. Because we know that really outside of God's marvelous grace, where all of us would be today... So as we look at this hymn of praise, and as we think about our salvation, we really see the Trinity in this passage of Scripture. We see God the Father, we see God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so today, as we think about our salvation, we give Him all the credit as we think about the Trinity and how the Trinity works in our salvation. Now, something that is interesting in each one of these sections as he talks about God the Father first, he ends in verse 6 with this uh, praise. He says in verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace. And then he's going to talk about God the Son and what God the Son has done for our salvation. And then he concludes that section in verse 12, to the praise of his glory. And then he's going to conclude and he's going to talk about what God the Holy Spirit has done for us regarding our salvation. And he concludes that section with to the praise of his glory. Glory. So it's all about giving praise to God. Now, in order to give credit where credit is due, we must acknowledge three different things. Three different things that God has done regarding our salvation as we look at our text today. First of all, in verses 4 through 6, we see that God the Father initiated our salvation. God the Father initiated our salvation. Now, let me just say this. In this text, you see what appears to be a paradox a dichotomy. You see two truths, they're both true, but they're happening at the same time. And in our minds they seem to conflict. But in the all-knowing mind of God, they, they both go together. And we'll talk about that in, in a few moments. But first we see that God the Father initiated our salvation. What Paul does here in these, in these verses, 4 through 6, he starts off by just simply saying, okay, I'm going to give credit for our salvation. I'm going to give credit for my salvation because I know that ultimately my salvation did not start with me. It started with God. And that is what is true of all of us. Our salvation did not start with us. Our salvation started with God Almighty. He gets the credit for our salvation because he took the initiative in our salvation. Notice his plan, verse 4. He says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption 
as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. So it says there in verse 4 that he chose us. That is the Greek word electo. That means to elect. Several different times in this passage he mentions the word predestined. The two go together. To predestine literally means to determine beforehand. He chose us to be his redeemed people. He chose the church. And you see this, this um, idea of election throughout the scriptures. Throughout the scriptures. You see Abraham was chosen to be the father of the nation of Israel. Israel was God's chosen people. Moses was God's chosen man. The disciples were God's chosen people. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. That is, the, that is his plan. But notice also in verse 4 the timing of his plan. Paul says, when did this happen? When did this happen? He says, before the foundation of the world. God had a plan to save us before we were ever even born. Listen, this is the wonderful truth. Before God was even on our minds, we were on His mind. Our salvation, our salvation is not plan B. Do you realize that? God didn't in the garden say, uh-oh, man has messed up. They're not working towards my plan. Now I've got to come up with another plan. The wonderful news of the gospel, the plan of salvation was started before the foundation of the world, before the worlds were even formed. That's what the scripture says. Revelation 13, 8, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it, referring to the Antichrist. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. That's the timing of his plan. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon said, I'm sure he chose me before I was born or else he never would have chosen me afterwards. The timing of his plan. How about the purpose of his plan? We get the purpose of his plan in verse 4 as well, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So what is the purpose of this plan? God had a purpose. He had a plan. He had a plan because he wanted us to be holy. That is, to be, to be holy means to be separated from sin and set apart for God. If you are saved today, whether or not you feel like it, you are holy in Christ Jesus. Positionally, as believers in Christ, we are holy, not because of our own righteousness, but because of the imputed righteousness that we received at the moment that we cried out for salvation. We have been set apart from sin. We have been set free from the power of sin, and we have been set apart for the use of God. Well, also a part of this, this purpose behind this plan he has, well, not only that we should be holy, but also that we should be blameless. To be blameless means to be without spot or position. Now, he's talking here positionally speaking. Positionally speaking, the moment you are saved, and what do I mean by being saved? I know many of you know what I mean by that, but perhaps some of you are sitting here and you say, what does he mean by being saved? It's that time in your life where you acknowledge that you are a sinner and you need to be forgiven of your sin, that you have sinned against God. There is a debt that you have earned against God and there is nothing that you can do to pay that debt back. You are hopeless without a relationship with Jesus Christ, so you turn from your sin and you embrace Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. And in that moment, instantaneously, you are saved. You are saved, and positionally, when God looks at you, he no longer sees you as a sinner, but he sees you as a saint. You are forgiven. You are blameless. That is in your position. Now, in our practice, as believers in Christ, we still mess up. We're all in the process of that sanctification process, which we are growing in grace. We are, we are daily being more conformed into the image of God Almighty. But he says the purpose of, that, of this plan was, was to make us holy and to make us blameless without spot or blemish. Now, I don't know if you saw the news this week, but I saw something uh, uh, in Italy. The, the Lamborghini Corporation dedicated a brand new 
uh, Lamborghini. It was worth 200 and something thousand dollars. And they, and they gave it to the Catholic Church to be sold off for charity. And something terrible happened to that beautiful piece of machinery. The Pope took a Sharpie after he blessed it and he signed the hood of it. That Lamborghini is no longer blameless. It's got a mark on it. The purpose of our salvation was to make us holy and blameless. Colossians chapter 1 verse 22. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. And what was the motivation of his plan? Verse 4. The motivation of his plan was that we are to be holy and blameless before him in love. In love. Why was it that God took the initiative in our salvation? Why did he select us? Why did he choose us? Because of his love. The motivation behind his sovereign working was love. God determined before the founder of this world that we would be his because of his love for us. And because of his love for us, he would provide us a redeemer. He would provide us a savior. Going to the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7 through 8. He says, speaking to the Old Testament people, the Israelites, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Jesus. The motivation behind this beautiful plan was love. 1 John 4, 19 tells us this. We love him because he what? He first loved us. It was not because he looked and said, you know what, I see some foreseen merit in, in Brother Eric, and so I'm going to set my love upon him, or, or for you for that matter. It was because of his amazing love. The late great preacher Adrian Rogers said this in this context. He said, it is his choice of us that enables us to make our choice of him because of his love. Now what was the result of this plan. The result of this plan is in verse 5. The result, he says, in love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. The result of this marvelous plan is, is that for all who turn away from their sins and embrace the Savior, the moment of salvation the moment you call out to Him to be your Savior and your Lord, you become a child of God. You are adopted into the family of God. We become sons and daughters of the King. Before we are saved, we are sons of Satan. We are, we are citizens of the dark. But in the moment of salvation, the result... Is, is that we are adopted into the family of God. Now, in Paul's day, in Roman times, under, under Roman law, one who was adopted, listen to this, one who was adopted enjoyed the same status and privileges as if he was a real son. So, so because we have been adopted into the family of God, we, we now have all the, the rights and privileges of the Son, Jesus Christ. That's the result of his plan. And then finally, the aim of his plan. What was the ultimate aim behind this plan? Why did God ultimately initiate our salvation? We find it in verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. The aim of his plan. He did all of this ultimately for his glory. If you are one today and you sit here and you are redeemed, you are saved. Yes, you are on your way to heaven. And that is certainly a, a byproduct of your salvation. But the ultimate purpose of your salvation was for the glory of God. So that throughout 
the eternity. You would be a trophy of grace used by God Almighty to bring Him glory. He, church, wants all the glory. He doesn't want some of the glory and then gives us a little bit of the glory. He wants all the glory. And so Paul is showing us that there is no room for boasting for us. Church, when we get to heaven and we step into the gates of glory, we're not going to stop and say, okay, now just, God, give me a couple hundred years just initially so that I can praise myself because I'm here. No, we will fall on our hands and knees and we will see only, only because of the grace of God that I am here. So we must first acknowledge that our personal faith rests upon the prior work of God's grace in our life. He initiated our salvation. Number two, in verses 7 through 12, God the Son obtained our salvation. God the Son obtained our salvation. So now he's going to go to the second person of the Trinity. He's going to talk about God the Son. And he starts out and he speaks of the purchase he made. Who's the he? This is Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead. The purchase he made. Notice verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. And then he goes on, speaking of this inheritance, verse 11, that we have obtained because of Christ. So the purchase he made, what did he purchase for us? And remember, when Christ Jesus was on the cross, there was a transaction that was happening. And, and Jesus Christ was purchasing us. He was purchasing us. Several things that speak of this purchase. Number one, we are redeemed. Redeemed. To redeem means to make a payment to release a person from bondage. So like in Romans times, you could, you could redeem a slave off of the slave market of, sin, or of slavery. You could pay a redemption price which would release that person from slavery. Well, his death on the cross paid for our release from the power of sin and the penalty of sin. So when Christ Jesus died on the cross, he was paying for the penalty for our sin. All the wrath of God was poured out upon him. It should have been us that was paying that penalty, but he paid it for us. And also he paid in order to release us from the power of sin. The, the great news is today, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the power, not your own power, but you have the spirit inside of you that gives you the power to say no to sin and yes to God. And that was purchased on the cross. Then secondly, Regarding this purchase, he mentions forgiven because of the cross. The penalty of our sins have been paid. And by the way, Jesus didn't pay this ransom price to the devil. That's a false view. Paid to God the Father. God is a just God. Our sins earned a debt against God. And that debt has to be paid. We can't pay that sin debt back by being a good person, by being a Baptist, by being a Southern Baptist, by, by reading your Bible, by getting baptized, by trying to be a good person. None of those things, while all those things are good things, none of those things can pay your sin debt back. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. And because it's been paid, we are forgiven. In Sunday school, we learned how in the Old Testament, on the Day of Atonement, there was that temporal covering. And the scriptures speak of how our sins are separated as far as the east is from the west. And we talked about how, why does the Bible not say our sins are separated as far as the north is from the south? You know why? Because you can measure. You can measure from the north pole to the south pole. But you can't measure between east and west. That is how far our sins are now separated from us. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Get it down, church. If you know Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you never have to worry about facing condemnation for your sins because God the Son took that for you on the cross. 
Another benefit because of this, this price that he paid was it says that we were enlightened. We were enlightened. It says, um, making, verse 9, making known to us the mystery of his will. So, so what does that mean? That means that when we're saved, we now have the Spirit of God that gives us the mind of God. And so as God's people, we understand that God has a purpose There is a plan at work here in this world in which we live. And so that when we see things that appear to be falling apart, we know that in reality things are not falling apart because he has a purpose and a plan. Now, sometimes we don't understand why things happen the way that they do. And so I I don't want to make light of any difficulty you may be facing, but even in your darkest hours... You take comfort in knowing that God still has a purpose behind everything that happens in your life. Because you've been enlightened. You've been enlightened to the mystery of his will. We can make sense of this world. But listen to what 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says. It says, The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly or foolishness to him. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. That's why when you speak to your lost family members and your co-workers, you talk to them about spiritual things, they just kind of look at you like that calf looking at that new gate. It's like a just like a blank, a blank stare. They they don't, it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense to them because they haven't been enlightened. And then finally. Because of this purchase that Jesus Christ provided for us, he purchased an inheritance. We've been enriched. We've been enriched. Notice that, verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance. Now, presently speaking, we we have that inheritance in this sense. That that right now, we experience spiritual uh, freedom. We know that, that we, we have been set free from our sin, that we, we have forgiveness. And by the way, knowing that you are forgiven is priceless, by the way. It could be that you don't get any sleep at night because there is turmoil in your soul because you don't know if you are forgiven. In Christ Jesus, we are forgiven. We have fellowship with God. All those are present aspects of this inheritance but there's a future aspect of this inheritance and that's glory when we will one day step into his presence and we will forever be with the lord so that's the 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 payment the purchase that he made but then also when we talk about god the son we think we we have to talk about the price he paid yes he made a purchase But there was a price, it says, through his blood. You see, in order for this to be true of us today, in order for us to sing and give praise to him that we are forgiven, in order for us to be joyful knowing that we've been set free from sin, knowing that this is not our best life now, folks, Guess what? If you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, this is your worst life now. This is the worst it will ever get. But for lost people, this is the best it will ever get. Imagine that. This life being the best it will ever get. But if you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, this is the worst it will ever get. And one day we will be in His presence. But that was not free. It cost Him His life. He wasn't just put on the cross, hung there, cut a few places and shed some blood. No, he died. As God the Son, he died on the cross in order to make this purchase. So, today as we give credit to where credit is due, we give credit to God the Son who obtained our salvation. And then finally, in verses 13 through 14, as we give credit to where credit is due, we see that God the Spirit sealed our salvation. God the Spirit sealed our salvation. Again, we see that in verses 13 through 14. Let's just read those verses again. In him you also, 
when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Why do we praise him today? Why do we give him credit for our salvation? Because God the Spirit sealed our salvation. The moment you are saved, church, the moment you are saved, you receive the Spirit of God. He comes to live inside of you. Romans chapter 8 says, He who does not have the Spirit is not God's. You can't be saved and not have the Holy Spirit. The moment you're saved, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now again, this speaks of you... The context of what Paul is writing, he's writing in the context of the Romans. And when they would send a letter, they would seal it with the emperor's seal. We have been sealed with the Spirit of God. Therefore, the seal of the Spirit identifies us. When that Roman emperor would send a letter, it would be an official letter... He wanted the recipient to know that it was authentic, that it truly came from the emperor. He would put his seal on it. It was a seal of ownership. Some of you, maybe you have branded cows. You put that brand on there because you were saying, this cow belongs to me. Now guess what? Our souls have been branded with the Holy Spirit. He says, this one Belongs to me. He's off limits. I own him. Because we have been bought with a price. So the seal of the Spirit identifies us. Number two, the seal of the Spirit assures us. It assures us. This is, you think about when a man and woman, they meet, they fall in love, and then they sense that God wants them to get married. That Man will give that woman an engagement ring. It's a seal of his promise. He is serious. It's like a down payment. If you've ever made a big purchase, you make a down payment. That down payment is your way of giving assurance that you are serious about this purchase. Well, when we're saved, we're given the Holy Spirit that assures us, it assures us that He belongs or we belong to Him. And that assurance, the Spirit of God assures you that you belong to, get to Him. And that reminds us that He's going to come back and He's going to receive us to Himself. So the seal, the seal of the Spirit identifies us. The seal of the Spirit assures us. And then finally... The seal of the Spirit secures us. It secures us. An official Roman letter was always sealed with that, that signet ring of the, of the emperor. He would stamp it in the hot wax and then seal that letter. Therefore, it could not be tampered with. The, 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 the tomb of our Lord was sealed by the Roman authorities. That tomb was off limits. And guess what? Today, if you know Christ Jesus, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. The devil, yourself, you can't tamper with what belongs to God. We are secure in Christ because we have God's seal on us. So, we have seen... That God the Father, He initiated our, our salvation. Today we give credit to God for our salvation because God the Son obtained our salvation. And then finally, we give credit to God and Him alone for our salvation because God the Spirit sealed our salvation. Now, four quick words of application. Four quick words of application. Number one, embrace the mystery of salvation. Embrace the mystery of salvation. Again, you see in the scriptures this, this paradox. You see 
the sovereignty of God. We've seen this today. But yet, you see in the scriptures the responsibility of man. You see them, both, both truth, both truths, but they seem to contradict one another. It's been said that the, the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man to turn from their sins and embrace the Savior. It's like, in our minds, it's like a railroad track. You have two tracks, and, they're, and they're, par- they're parallel, and it seems as if they never come together. And in our minds, we want to somehow bring it together. But the Scripture makes it clear that they're both, they're both true. You see them in Scripture. You say, well, you say, preacher, um, you know, do you, do, you, do you believe that God chose us for salvation? Yeah, I do. Well, why do you say that? Well, because that's what the Bible says. But on the other side of the coin, you say, preacher... Do you believe that we have the responsibility to cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ that there is a decision we must make to turn from our sins and embrace the Savior? Yeah, I believe that. You say, why do I believe that? Well, because that's what the Bible says. For whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, well, then that doesn't make sense. I've got to reconcile this. No, you just leave it as a mystery and you by faith just embrace it and you let God sort out or sort out the details. You see, many have, have erred on this by trying to be too, too weighty on either side. And, and if, you, if you say, well, well, the sovereignty of God is the only thing that is true in scriptures, then you compromise scripture. But if you say, well, the free will of man, that's, that's the only thing that is true in scripture. Well, then you compromise the truth of, of scripture. They're, they're, both, they're both true. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Revelation 22, 17, The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. That means ultimately, today, The decision is up to you. We preach the gospel to every single person and we leave the results up to God. It was D.L. Moody who once said, that great evangelist, he said, the elect are the whosoever wills, the non-elect are the whosoever wants. Don't ever believe, don't ever believe that somebody can want to be saved But God will say, you can't be saved because you're not my chosen. Don't ever believe that. The Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you see both truths happening in Scripture. We don't have to try to reconcile. Listen, theologians have, tried, have debated this for years, and I promise you this. We're not going to be the ones to solve this. We leave it a mystery, and we embrace it, and we leave it up to God. So number two, not only should we embrace the mystery of salvation, but we need today receive the man of salvation. Receive the man of of salvation maybe today the spirit of God is speaking to your heart and there's turmoil in your in your soul because you don't have peace with God you know that you have sinned against God and you have and the Bible says that the wages of sin is death if you die without Jesus Christ you will spend an eternity in hell but the good news of the gospel is you don't have to Receive the man of salvation. That simply means you come to him just as you are. You turn from your sins and you acknowledge him to be the Savior and Lord of your life. You believe that he died on the cross for you. And on the third day he rose again. And you surrender to him to be the Lord and Savior of your life. And he'll forgive you of all your sins. And he'll make of you a new creation in Christ. Number three. What is this What does this beautiful theological gem of a text motivate us to do? Well, number three, it motivates us to spread the message of salvation. We are commanded to go and preach the gospel to every single person. 
trusting that his sheep hear his voice. Do you hear this right here in the text? It says in verse 13, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Romans says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And how shall they hear without a what? A preacher. So the sovereignty of God, we see it's true, but we leave that to God. We just go out and we fulfill the Great Commission and we go out and preach the gospel to every single person we come in contact with. And if you want to practice, preach the gospel to that wall. It won't get saved. But that's the mentality we have. We preach the gospel to every single individual because we know that there is forgiveness and life in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 2.21, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 13, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He doesn't say you might be saved, you will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then finally, what does this text motivate us to do? Well, fourth and finally, it motivates us to rest Rest in the marvel of salvation. As we have Thanksgiving this week, celebrate. Rest in the marvel of salvation. The fact that He thought of us before we were ever born. He thought of us. He had a plan for us. He paid the price in full for our salvation on the cross. As He hung on the cross just before He died, He says, it is what? It is finished. It's been paid in full. And finally, we rest in the marvel of salvation because we are secure in Him. Nothing can snatch us out of the Father's hand. And that includes yourself, by the way. If you're saved today, you're forgiven. You're freed. And you're sealed until the day of redemption. And why is this true? Because of His amazing grace. And we give Him all the praise and the glory, because that's where credit is due. Let us pray. Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful text. Lord, we thank you that you initiated our salvation. We were on your minds way before we had you on our minds. Lord, we thank you that the Scripture says that you chose us, not because of anything good you saw in us, but because of your amazing love and your grace. And, oh, Lord, we thank you that you've paid the necessary price for us to be forgiven. We don't have to believe in you and then go out and do a certain number of good works in order to have your salvation. We have it simply through trusting in what you've already done for us. And, oh, Lord, we thank you that we rest today knowing that we are secure in Christ, that even on our worst days when we really mess up as believers, while we're never proud of our sin, we still stand with confidence in your grace, knowing that all who belong to you, you will keep until the very end. We are secure in you. And Lord Jesus, we pray that as we come to this time of invitation, that maybe today we need to motivate to get, be, to get up out of our seats and acknowledge that we need to be saved today. I pray, Holy Spirit, if there's anybody, you're, you're speaking to their heart right now. I, I pray that today would be the day that they submit and they receive you as the Lord and Savior of their life. Lord, as your, as your people, may we be motivated to go out and preach the gospel to the entire world. And we leave the results up to you. That's, that's up to you, and that's ultimately for your glory. But we just want to be obedient to do what you've called us to do. And, oh, Lord Jesus, I pray that today maybe there's one and they're just having a difficult time. And they just need to come to these altars and they need to cast their burden before you. Because we see that your grace truly is sufficient. We know, Lord, that because of your grace, one day if we're in Christ, you will take our souls from here and you'll take us to glory. And if you can do that, then there's no problem that we have in this life that you can't handle for us. So, Lord Jesus, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name.